Well, hello everyone. Today we are going to take a look at Antebellum, the latest movie from some people who were somehow involved with Get Out in a way that clearly did not involve writing or directing. This was written and directed by Gerard Bush and Christopher Menz and stars Janelle Monae, Eric Lange, and Jenna Malone. Janelle Monet appears to be living two lives in this movie. One life is as Veronica, a brilliant, successful woman who has a PhD and has written books and does various speaking engagements about various forms of oppression. And the other life is as Eden, a slave on a cotton plantation that has been commandeered by the Confederate Army to use as a base of operations during the Civil War. And the question is, how exactly do these two lives connect to each other? The answer may surprise and disappoint you. I was kind of looking forward to this one after I saw the trailer. I thought it looked pretty good, but I knew something was up when I started seeing ads for this that featured comments taken from social media from people who were looking forward to the movie, not from people who had actually seen it. That's a red flag. That right there is the marketing department just giving up. And I can't say I blame them because... This was incredibly disappointing. It is indeed a movie about slavery, much like 12 Years a Slave or Birth of a Nation, the 2016 one, mind you. But the thing about those movies is, in addition to being about the horrors of slavery, they also had real, fleshed-out characters that we could get behind or root against. And Antebellum really doesn't. There is nothing interesting about Veronica whatsoever, and that's not a knock on Janelle Monet's performance. She was fine, it's just the script gave her nothing to work with. We see her doing all these interviews, which are basically just TED Talks about racism and the patriarchy, and they are basic as hell, have no substance whatsoever. And the movie never really gave me a reason to give a shit about her, apart from the fact that she's a victim of white supremacy, which is fine if I'm reading a history book, but in a movie, I need a little more than that. The Confederates are just cardboard cutout villains, nothing more. Yes, they are doing horrible things and screw them, but again, I need something more here. Jenna Malone, bless her, she tried with what little screen time she had, but scenery chewing is not a character trait. There's also a character that shows up on this plantation, played by Kiersey Clemens, that was really disappointing. Basically what happens to her is she's brought to the plantation, she tries to make friends with one of the Confederate soldiers, and it backfires horribly on her. Then we find out she was pregnant, and she gets beaten so bad that she miscarries, and then she hangs herself. And that's it. Her entire arc, if you can even call it that, is bad shit happens to her and she dies the end. What was even the point of that? The only person in this movie that even came close to resembling an actual character was the one played by Gabri Sidibe, who plays one of Veronica's friends, and basically her character trait is she's the horny one. And that's it. It's a complete one-note character, but that is one note more than the rest of the characters had. Veronica didn't even get that one note. She was a no-note character. And that is one of the movie's main problems. The other problem is it's kinda dumb. I went into this expecting something in the style of Jordan Peele, but what I ended up with was closer to M. Night Shyamalan. This kinda reminded me of The Village at times, except with slavery. And yes, there is a Shyamalan-style twist, which I wasn't really expecting, mainly because it didn't make much sense. In fact, most of this movie does not make sense. There is a scene with Veronica where she does an interview with Elizabeth, which is Jenna Malone's character, over Skype, and after Elizabeth asks some very bizarre questions, Veronica suddenly says, I'm sorry, who are you with again? And I'm thinking, wait a minute. You agreed to do an interview with this lady, and you didn't even ask ahead of time what publication or network or whatever she's supposed to be with? You waited until you were in the middle of the interview? So you basically just agreed to an interview with this random white lady for no reason? Don't you have a PhD? You're supposed to be smarter than this. Also, if you've seen the trailer, you might remember that creepy girl in the hotel hallway. I have a question about said creepy girl, and my question is... What? When I saw her in the trailer, I thought she was supposed to be a ghost, and in that one scene, she certainly looks like she's made up to be a ghost. She's, like, powdered to hell, and she's dragging along this doll 
by the neck and apparently she's not a ghost at all because there are other scenes where she looks like a perfectly normal kid but in that one scene in the hotel she's dressed up like a ghost and i don't know what the hell is even going on was she just being creepy for the sake of it because that's just weird when I saw her in the trailer, I took it to mean that there was going to be some kind of supernatural element to the movie. In fact, there's a few things in the trailer that seem to suggest that, but no, there isn't. If I didn't know any better, I would swear the movie was originally supposed to have a supernatural element, but somewhere along the line that got changed, possibly in the middle of production. The tagline on the poster even seems to suggest such a thing. If it chooses you, nothing can save you. If it chooses you, what is it? Now, there are more things I would like to talk about, especially that twist, but I can't really do that without getting into spoilers. So, if you don't want to be spoiled, click the mute button until this goes away. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so as the movie is going on, I'm starting to wonder how exactly Veronica and Eden are supposed to be connected. Are they two characters in, like, a parallel universe that are somehow, like, spiritually connected or something? Is there some kind of time travel element going on? Or something to do with magic or, again, the supernatural? Well, it's none of those things. All of this is taking place in the present day, and Veronica and Eden are in fact the same person. What is actually happening in this movie is there is a group of white people kidnapping black people and using them to live out their stupid little confederate fantasies. They kidnap them and they bring them to this plantation and they make them pick cotton during the day and they rape them to sleep at night and that's apparently all they do all day. How is it that this is all these people do with their time? Do they not have jobs? Or is this their job now? And if so, who the hell is signing the checks? And if I read the credits correctly, the leader of this wannabe Confederate movement is supposed to be a senator. How does he find the time? Just, this is completely batshit. And this plantation is apparently located on the grounds of some sort of amusement park that does Civil War reenactments, very elaborate ones with live explosions and shit. It actually looks like a lot of fun. I'd probably have more fun watching that than I would this movie. And somehow they have managed to keep their little slavery operation completely hidden from the public, despite this park being visited every day by large numbers of people. I mentioned earlier this kind of reminded me of The Village because it's a bunch of rich white people who are living out their old-timey fantasies in isolation from the real world. But unlike the village, the people running this thing did not bribe the government to restrict the airspace, so you got planes flying over all the time. The movie even points this out, and yet no one has somehow spotted that there's a bunch of black people picking cotton out in the fields here? Really? They did at least have the good sense to restrict cell phones because those can be tracked, but you know it's only a matter of time until some idiot breaks that rule. And in fact they do. And how did they manage to kidnap such a large number of people without ever getting caught? And how was there never a revolt? Back in the day, slave revolts actually happened and they didn't have the luxury of the law being on their side. Again, I am convinced that this was not the original story. There must have been some kind of magic or evil spirits or wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff or some combination of the above. Now, eventually, Veronica does escape her captors, but she is the most easily sidetracked escapee I have ever seen. To start with, she manages to beat the ever-loving shit out of the white dude that is holding her captive, and at that point, all she has to do is jump on the guy's horse and ride the hell out of there. But she doesn't do that. First, she has to drag his ass over to this little crematorium that they use to dispose of slaves that have died or been killed, and after dragging him in there, she fools a couple of other white dudes into going in there, locks them in, lights the thing on fire, and there is this super dramatic shot of her walking away from this burning crematorium, torch in hand, pointless symbolism. Lady, you're supposed to be running away here. 
if these people were not looking for you before, they will now. You just lit a nice big signal fire for them. And then she has to stop and take the time to kill Jenna Malone's character, who is in remarkably little of the movie, but they brought her back just for her to die, I guess. And then, as she is finally on her way to freedom, she stops once again in front of a statue of Robert E. Lee. And I thought, oh God. She's going to stop in the middle of what is supposed to be her escape and take the time to tear down the statue, isn't she? Well, no, she did not. She stopped and looked at the statue and then kept on going. But I have a funny feeling that they filmed a scene where she tore the statue down and it ended up on the cutting room floor because someone finally realized it was a bit much. That is just a theory, but I could totally see that happening. Overall, I would say Antebellum was about two hours of wasted potential. There's a lot of talented people involved here. They just didn't get where they needed to be. Definitely not worth spending $20 to watch it on VOD. Maybe worth watching it when it eventually hits cable, but that's about as far as I would go. If you want to watch a movie from the producers of Get Out, just watch Get Out. And that's all I have to say about Antebellum. Till next time, take care.